viewers, welcome to the show. I'm Shivani Thapa Bosnet with you. With the uh, prime agenda of overall prosperity, the government stands with a lot of expectations and, of course, uh, uh, responsibility on its soldiers. At the same time, paved on the way are challenges of Herculean magnitude and also innumerable opportunities. And, of course, there are the new circumstances of the new federal setup with it to deal with, in fact. Uh, today, we discuss how far the government has fared in the past one year of its being with the person who's... Uh, at the center of it all. It's my pleasure to welcome to NTV Studios the Minister for Finance, Dr. Yuvaraj Khatiwara. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, from day one, for many reasons, uh, you've always uh, been looked up with a lot of expectations. Right. Having been at the rain for one long year, how, how difficult uh, was it for you to deal with your own expectations and the expectations from the whole mass? Well, I am there simply for the reason that there are problems in the economy and I have to fix the problems. Uh, a technocratic background, person with a technocratic background uh, can only address the challenges that are of complex nature and also multidimensional. Obviously, the job is challenging, but they are not insurmountable. Uh, in one year's time, we have cleared many hurdles and our uh, bulldozers on the road to our uh, prosperity. Uh, there are few issues which are left uh, yet to be addressed. Uh, they relate to attaining even higher economic growth uh, and also creating more jobs and at the same time also maintaining uh, the kind of external balance and financial stability. Uh, on the whole, uh, economic policy-wise, we are doing good. Uh, we have a huge uh, deficit in the infrastructure sector, particularly in terms of providing basic infrastructure facilities to our people and our society, uh, which relates to transportation, which relates to some other power-related uh, connectivity also. On that, we have to work further hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of it all, everything boils down to the indicators and the statistics. Exactly. Right. So <coughs> let's talk about something that's quite a buzz at the yeah. national level at the yeah. moment. Uh, if you go through, you, you just name them, uh, be it inflation up mm. by 6%, uh, FDI mm. down by 70%, and then trade deficit up over by around 32%, over 32%, and then the list goes on and on. So how do you want the no, people here to understand that's fundamentally that? wrong. We are talking the same component of the same stuff. Mm -hmm. Trade deficit, current account deficit, BOP deficit, or ex decline of reserves is the components of the same issue. That's external sector challenge. I tell you the other stories which would uh, explain how there is a stress in the external sector. When you are growing by more than 7% in real terms, in consecutive third year of the, uh, the country, you have a lot of stress on imports, construction materials, capital goods, industrial raw materials. If you are doing uh, 100 megawatt of uh, hydropower, how much you need uh, to invest? 50% or 60% of that you have to import. You are bringing 1.2 million tourists you have to burn fuel, no? that's also imported. And many tourists also have to consume imported goods. That includes some of the luxury goods. We need to have several facilities to the people, including transportation. Buses have to be imported, diesel have to be imported. And even in education, health in several areas, in agriculture in particular, you have to import chemical fertilizer. We doubled uh, uh, some of our activities in last one year, but because that was of the input we needed. Again, increase in agriculture was related to more, more, more or less one third increase in chemical fertilizer. So, we have to look into the structure of the economy itself, how it is import intensive. And if you expect that a finance minister can uh, just adjust or correct all these structural issues in one year, I think that could only be a magical person, uh, a, a person who believes in practice, perhaps it takes more time. I tell you the other case, 6% inflation is our target. We are, we are achieving inflation below that. There were days when inflation was about 22% in the previous government's regime, if you look at the history. 
Today we are not talking 22, we are only talking 4%, 4% and a half. That's one of the modest inflation we have. That's, that also necessary to keep on business going. It doesn't harm much to the people unless it hurts the consumers which are uh, buying basic things like food stuff. Food prices are growing by less than 3%, not more than that. So inflation is not an issue to be discussed at the moment. And the other issue relating to growth is jobs. This day I don't see any person talking about jobs. That's the fundamental thing. If you get jobs, you can have your purchasing power and to, you, to command goods and services so that even a small price rise doesn't matter. But if you are unemployed, even in a stable price, you cannot consume goods. Now, if you look at our growth pattern, which derives from agriculture, derives from manufacturing and comes from some of the services sector, which are job intensive, I guess uh, at least uh, uh, a few hundred thousand jobs have been created additionally to what we used to create. And through our intervention, through the Prime Minister's employment program and some other self-employment program generated through the concessional credit that is being provided to the youth, the women, the people who are affected by earthquake and those who return from employment abroad. Those kind of jobs have a uh, lot of implications to the well-being of the people. So I would urge that people look at the uh, larger and bigger picture which is growth, inflation, jobs, financial stability, fiscal stability which leads the whole economic uh, confidence for the people to have. Mm -hmm. But if you look at a micro level, just to add to what you said, uh, given you know the uh, inpour of the high remittance and the uh, increase in the consumption pattern of the country, uh, how, how is Nepal looking to the government looking to address uh, the increasing consumption pattern and you know the lessening productivity sector? Uh, Thank you. That's the it's sort a good of question. It's a good question. In this matter, preaching doesn't work. We have, sure. to, we have to see that how we can create goods and services at home which could substitute imports. That is fundamental. We say in two years time, we would be self-sufficient in some of the key food items. I don't say all, but for some of them, we would be self-sufficient. In more than a dozen of manufactured goods, uh, which include food processed goods or construction materials, we are going to be self-sufficient. And in some of the goods which the country doesn't require at all, which uh, damage our health, which damages the environment, we need to prohibit them. But given the global trading rule, we cannot simply deny imports. There are rules that we have to apply. So we are drafting an uh, anti-dumping act that would uh, help us to uh, discretionary adjust our tariff policies and our uh, import policy that would help to reduce unnecessary consumption. But so far as the remittance driven consumption is concerned, we have to understand that many, many of such consumptions are derived uh, from the fundamental rights of the citizens like right to food, right to basic and primary education, right to primary health care. The families uh, whose member has gone out and sending money back, the families are exactly spending money on those things. That also includes shelter, a small house they build. And if you say this is all consumption, I don't think this is the case. Most of such income is spent on capital formation, human capital formation, education, health, shelter, and nutritious food all create human resources and that is what we call human capital. And only, only a few of them who could use luxurious mobiles are very you know, very large um, screen televisions or some other things. People see those are unnecessary consumptions. I agree with that. But for most of the smaller persons, smaller earners from abroad, their consumptions are basic. So we should understand the welfare of the households. Mm -hmm. Said that, let's get back to the bigger picture uh, and <coughs> talking about the much cliched terminology about the capital expenditure. It has become cliched for uh, over the past yeah. so many years yeah. in Nepal. Now, although the federal budget was unveiled around in May, very much early than the previous times, uh, still, still, it did not help in these spendings. So, so and I agree. how does that work? This, how does this that one, I, I fully agree. Uh, the, the concept of early budget is that by the beginning of the new fiscal year, you should be able to spend. Uh, budget is released and programs are approved already and you start the construction. 
that's the in, the in the normal case that has to be the case but let me also explain this fiscal year which is the beginning of the fiscal federalism a year where we started not from even ground zero we started from a negative point where we were in a mess we had to create legal structure to spend even the capital expenditure we had to create then um, organizations then employees then budget release process and then the division of responsibility between the province and local governments along with the federal one. So these things took uh, almost half a year. You can ask us that we could do it in three months time, I agree. We took a few months more than, uh, more than that was required, but also for the reason that to create all these laws and others, we had to prioritize some other laws which related to the fundamental rights of the citizens, they were to be enacted. Uh, the civic uh, civil code related laws and then some other laws which contradict with the constitution. So our, our priorities were somewhere else in the very beginning but now I would, I would just uh, um, uh, tell everybody that the laws, the regulations, the organization structure, the employees and the budget release process they are all in place now by the end of this fiscal year we spend all the money not necessarily in the last two months, we start spending right next month. So that uh, works are already started but uh, release of funds is taking some time. Uh, by the end of fiscal year we will be exactly over pressed for uh, having more budgets. Mm -hmm. So that's my assurance to, right. to the but question. But in the middle of all this, uh, the, f the provinces, they have had complaints to the center about them not having delegated enough authority to spend uh, these budget allocated for them. That could be discussed. Mm -hmm. There are two views. Uh, the provinces, uh, as they are empowered to, to act on the uh, development activities which are inside in the constitution, uh, they have their legitimate claim. We have to understand it. At the same time, uh, some of our colleagues are, are of the view that if we just hand over each and every project at, the, at a time when there are no structures, uh, no employees or no other kind of basic facilities, perhaps this program, they, they might fall in, uh, in a disarray. That's, that's why in many cases, uh, the center has said that we will gradually hand over the activities to the provinces. And I am sure that. In the next year's budget, there won't be such question. This is first year of the fiscal federalism implementation. And in six months time, such kind of uh, gray area is obvious to create. But over time, after the interprovincial um, uh, council meeting with the prime minister, we have cleared many areas of our common responsibility. And after that, uh, our jobs have become even clearer. And now budget release has also taken place. So the incomplete projects that, has, that have to be implemented at the province level uh, are to be implemented by themselves. Uh, there would be some other issues like uh, issues related to security, issues related to some other powers. But so far as capital expenditure is concerned, uh, there is not much debate now onwards. Mm -hmm. One could be, yes, we are just uh, entering into a federal setup and yes, you, you yeah. are here, you still yeah. to gain that confidence from your from the mechanism that has been set. Uh, but uh, does this also mean that uh, given the state coffers, uh, is the government not in a very comfortable position to take any chances? No. No, the state coffer is in a comfortable position. I, I would, I would uh, like to mention the revenue performance. The tax revenue is growing by about 28 percent, double the rate that was uh, at the same period last year. Non-tax revenue is a little bit slow, is going up by 12, 13 percent. On an average, our revenue performance has gone up by 26 percent or more. Uh, and then we are mobilizing more uh, foreign resources. The issue with the provinces is how to utilize resources uh, that come from the foreign resources because we had agreement with the federal government. The donors had agreement with the foreign, uh, with the federal government and now the programs have to be implemented at the provincial level. And when it has to be reworked out, uh, every file, every agreement has to move to their headquarters. So in some of the cases, uh, the projects have to be brought up from the province level. And that creates a kind of uh, chaos in, in terms of our project implementation. But our copper should be now enough to cover the cost 
uh, which project which is projected in the current year's budget. Uh, I don't say we are always enough because uh, resources are always scarce, but our efforts are to maximize domestic revenue, also to maximum utilize uh, the foreign resources and see if we have some space to borrow from the domestic market. We also use that opportunity uh, without crowding out the private sector's opportunity to invest because they are, we are sharing the same resources. True, and also it's obvious that it's a foundation laying year. It has been a foundation yeah. laying yeah. year, and it will continue for some time, of yeah. course. Uh, but the versions, the versions, the, the very uh, versions from the government is very much conflicting, or I would say the independent economists and academicians uh, version has been very much conflicting from the governments. Uh, said that, could you shed light on the milestones derived by the government in the past year in laying that foundation that you claim? Well, if you start from ground negative, I don't say ground zero, you don't see many things upcoming because it's yet to come up. But uh, the implementation of constitution uh, and to, to operationalize the federalism, creating all the laws and enabling conditions, and that also in a very smooth way, resource sharing without much of the conflict, don't you think it's a big job? We have seen federal setups where provinces are even after the federalization of 20, 30, 40 years, they are fighting over resources. We have set a, such a standard formula and mechanism that except for a few here and there, we were able to share our responsibilities and resources in such a friendly and amicable way. Take for example in taxation, in sharing expenditure and also in taking up shared responsibility. Uh, I think uh, nobody believed that we could do it as smooth as it could be. So, uh, this is one example. The second example is uh, recovering from the kind of economic chaos we had, discipline. Putting everything back to economic discipline. In the past, we had a mechanism of budget release, new program, announcement and also approving budget all over the year. Uh, forget the parliamentary decision on or the approval of the budget. It was everyday business, making budget and spending. We stopped that. We are now rule-based fiscal governance. The other issue is setting up all these organization and adjustments at the provincial and local level. In fact, we created 761 budgets through expenditure allocations. It was not one budget we did. And, and then you can guess how difficult it is to work for 761 that also in an agreeable terms. The other issue is uh, to, to propel the growth process. I think that's, that's even much important. We are expecting even, even higher economic growth, uh, but somehow some of our projects like the Melamchi or Tamakoshi, uh, which are a bit lagging behind from our expectation that we could commence their production right from the month of April or May is not taking place. Some of the um, capital expenditure is not taking place as you rightly pointed out. Other than that, we were able to set most of our expenditures uh, in, in place. That's also a, a kind of uh, good progress. Now in terms of uh, jobs and social security, it's a, it's, I think it's a leapfrogging, mm -hmm. which is also the implementation of the fundamental rights of the citizen. When we say right to employment in the constitution, don't you have to work further? And for that we have, we have just started this uh, Prime Minister's Employment Program, uh, Contributory Social Security Schemes and Self-Employment Programs which just uh, serve the purpose of the um, uh, Constitution. Similarly, there are several other areas where uh, we, are, we have been working. So the groundwork has been done and irrespective of any, any criticism it comes, the results themselves will just prove that we have done mm -hmm. good thing. I have to wait for some months, maybe, maybe a few months, but uh, I don't claim now the results themselves have to show and prove that we have been doing good things. So it's a wait and watch kind yeah. of situation yeah. at the yeah. moment. Certainly I'll come back to the programs you just said, uh, but at the moment if I may draw your attention towards the Global Ease in Doing Business report wherein Nepal slumped five position down, and if I understand you, even opposed to uh, yeah. the results that they indicated up there. 
So what yeah. sort of message that yeah. goes up and what's your actually, position? Actually, uh, this uh, doing a business index uh, is a competitive index. Even if you don't do any harm, some others doing much better, you fall behind. In our case, uh, I would say that that index belongs to the period before we were in the government. The cutoff, uh, cutoff point for this uh, evaluation was May 1st, 2017, 2018. So you can guess that uh, our reforms are not reflected in that index first. Second, uh, when we introduced some social security norms and those were related to taxation and that added some tax compliance issues with the uh, employers, only that uh, eroded our ranking. And I said, if you are having welfare to the laborers, making provisions for them and improving industrial relation and also creating better business environment and you rank us low then. What is this? That was my question. The second question was about the uh, validity of the respondents. The, the questions uh, they asked to somebody were not validated or uh, cross-checked with the government officials. So uh, they are now not only revising uh, it but also helping us in particular as to how we can improve our uh, um, doing business index. So I, I thank World Bank for having initiated such a very prompt uh, work. And we do hope that in coming years evaluation will be much better. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, in the backdrop that the government is now preparing um, for the investment summit in March, I'm sure reports like these certainly would have an impact and you've made your say. Uh, also, there have been accusations that the call for investment that the government so aggressively is making at all forums are sort of hollow and something like that. Uh, how much effort has uh, the government, uh, you know, um, made besides making the call at various forums to better uh, the, con the concerned areas like infrastructure and then there is this uh, uh, corruption control stuff that's emerging like anything at the moment and also there are uh, administrative pr uh, procedures and policies. So how much work has been done in this sector? Well, uh, let me just uh, respond to your um, uh, comment that there are some people in this country, they think they are the only people to run the country. Uh, they are the only, only persons who are eligible to, to run the government. Mm -hmm. No other person can run the government. No other government should do any investment summit. No other government should address the concerns of the people. I, I just uh, suggest and I urge uh, those people to hold until next election. You would be again tested to the people an investment summit. This government has to be introduced with the investors. We have our development policies, our development roadmap, how we want to work with the private sector, how we want to work with foreign investment, what are we doing to improve the business environment. Cannot we just tell this to the International Investment Committee? Should we just stick on what people did two years before when laws were not enacted? Even the employment law was not properly enacted, Industrial Enterprise Act was not enacted, several other laws were not even introduced. We are now doing all the legal preparatory work to, to, to introduce the uh, kind of things we have been doing, to build confidence to the investors and to tell them what our development priorities are. Two years before there was issue of even electricity load shedding not enough power. There was also issue of labor relation. We have settled those issues and now we have been talking to the international community that this is our development roadmap which goes along with the private sector, hand in hand, government working together. So we have to also s set a level of confidence to investors also by creating uh, some of the laws which protect their pro property, in including the intellectual property, uh, forget other physical property and then also setting that there is a rule of law, setting that the court is independent and to say that if arbitrage, uh, arbitration has to be done, you have a mechanism for the same. And uh, if we do all these things, we can have even better environment for foreign investors. And one thing uh, which I want to clear here that we really need foreign capital and technology. That's the complementary to our domestic capital and technology. 
domestic investment is necessary. That's the first uh, foremost priority. But then we need also foreign capital. And when we are doing something to bring in more foreign capital, instead of borrowing more, we are trying to bring in more investment because we don't have any liability when you invest, when you get, get uh, some investment in. So I think, uh, and I would also like to call upon all the Nepali intellectuals to support this vision and uh, cooperate with the government to bring in more investment which would secure the future of their children, our children, everybody's children. It is for the benefit of the country, the whole people, not the Communist Party of Nepal which, is, which they claim should be benefiting. It's for all Nepali and there is no reason why one should not support such an endeavor. Mm -hmm. So how <laughs> early uh, do we expect the Foreign Investment and Technology Transfer Act? Yeah, the technology, uh, the Foreign Investment and Technology Transfer Act is passed by the cabinet. It would go to the parliament uh, next next week. Uh, next week means uh, working days, um, starting from Monday if you, if you take it that way. And then uh, depending upon the parliamentary business, we expect this bill to be passed on uh, before the summit takes place. Uh, we have done a substantive reform, we have proposed a substantive reform in the uh, Foreign Investment Technology Transfer Act, in brief we call it FITA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we are working on Intellectual Property Act and several other acts which encourage investment through the Investment Board of Nepal. Uh, but having said that, uh, it's not only the laws, uh, the basic issue is of the operational, like how fast we can get re company registered, how fast can we get approval from ministries of land, ministries of forest, and ministry, ministry of other uh, stakeholders. And then uh, also foreign exchange regulation related issues. Uh, we are having one single stop mechanism to ensure that the operational issues are resolved. And that's also um, provisioned in the act, uh, investment act. Uh, the final issue is our own attitude, behavior, and how you want to cooperate with the foreign investors. Mm -hmm. That one is a totally human issue, a behavioral issue. We have also to change our mindset, not thinking that what I will get out of this investment. Oftentimes we are obsessed with our own personal interest. We should always rise above our personal interest and see what the country will benefit from this. If the country benefits, there should be no if or but. We should be part of the process and facilitate the investment. This is where we, we are also. We also have to reform and improve our own attitude and behavioral and foreign I investment. I also wanted to add here something um, about uh, basically one major concern because when an investor comes, they always want to come to garner profit, and you know they come with some objective. And then the NCL and the Asiata scandal. If I refer to that, I'm sure this is not sending out a very good message to the world community at the moment. Uh, wh what is Nepal's legal position uh, at the moment, or if you're working on that uh, regarding uh, the security of investment? profit? I think we have thousands of foreign investors. Have you heard any other case where uh, repatriation has been stopped? No. That only means that there are problems with some of the investments. If they are not transparent in their operation, if they haven't cleared the dues, or if they are not complying with the regulator's norms, uh, I think nowhere in the world you can do business. That applies to our country also. We also run by the rule of the law. So uh, that only tells us that the country must uh, have some proper rules and laws which uh, nobody can just uh, get excused. I think that is a positive message rather than the negative message. The other issue uh, regarding protection of property is the Intellectual Property Act as I referred, and then uh, Industrial Enterprise Act. Uh, and also PETA, which says that no private property would be confiscated or nationalized by the government and uh, right to hold property and uh, make transactions uh, are secured. This is by constitution and also by the investment laws. And I, I would just like to add a couple of points more. Nepal is a member of MIGA, Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency of the World Bank. We also follow that principle of MIGA. And we are also doing some other bilateral investment agreements like BIPA we used to call before. 
BIPA was somehow debated in the past because of timing and because of some of the conditions. But now we are also trying to have a framework law uh, for this uh, bilateral investment agreement which also guarantees the investors property having brought into Nepal. I think those are enough. And, and then the court, uh, the efficiency and the, and the uh, promptness of the court would be important. So we have also to strengthen uh, commercial courts. Mm -hmm. That would be sufficient, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Taking you a little away from the investment uh, part, and before we wrap up, I would certainly want to bring up the recently launched Prime Minister's Employment Programme, because the intent as it looks good, I think the public has received it uh, with a lot of curiosity uh, uh, regarding uh, the objective of the government, because uh, many uh, believe that uh, this allowance uh, uh, provisions certainly would not drive the, uh, you know, youths towards the productive sector. So what is That's the That's That's a misconception. First, the Prime Minister's uh, employment program is an employment guarantee program, 100 days of work guaranteed. When you guaranteed a job and when you cannot meet your guarantee, what do you do? You have to compensate, no? But we want to let that situation to come. We guarantee the job and we create jobs because this country needs more people to work at public works. And there, uh, at least 100 billion rupees worth of wages are created every year. And with a daily wage of 500, 600, you can guess how many jobs could be created with 100 billion money that we spend as wages. That's one. Second, this you know, Prime Minister Employment Program is not for self-employment. We have other programs for self-employment which are related to uh, uh, agriculture or any business you want to do with concessional loan. And third, uh, there are social security provisions in our constitution which is also fundamental right and all citizens have the right to social security means when you don't get job and you are the only breadwinner in your family, no other people are employed, then you will get the unemployment benefit, yes, that's you. by constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank, thank you, you very for much. the inputs. We could have stretched it longer, but we do have a time limit to hearing to follow to. Thank you so much for coming over and My privilege to clarify several issues that's coming in the floor. Thank yes, you. Certainly. So at the moment, it's certainly a wait and watch and looking forward to what's better and a prosperous dawn. Uh, to all our viewers, that was a brief conversation with the uh, Minister of Finance, Dr. Yuvraj Khatiura, uh, wherein we d discussed about or looked back in the past one year about where the country's economic uh, sphere has come to. Uh, so that we will see you next time with another burning issue. Until then, from all of us here at the NTV studios, goodbye and namaste.